Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Paul Atkins toko ingoa, ko ho te tumu fukare o uh, Raw Society te Aparangi. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai. Haere mai ki tēnei whareitino atahua. Haere mai i runga, i te kaupapa, o te rā oranga kainga. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's lovely to see you all here. I'm Paul Atkins, the Chief Executive of the Raw Society Te Aparangi. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you here and to welcome Philippa uh, to come and talk to us. Before I do that, though, I have some really important things to say, and you'll guess what they are. <laughs> the bathrooms. Out of the door here, hard left. In the case of an earthquake, please drop, cover, hold, and don't move until you're invited to do so uh, by people who will know what to do. Uh, and there's one of the gentlemen, uh, gentlemen there will help us. Uh, in the event of the alarms going off, uh, the meeting point is out of this store, the one you uh, came in, and turn right, and we meet out in the car park in Bunny Street. So that's that bit. Um, I would like to say one or two other things uh, first, and that is that the Royal Society um, of New Zealand, as it was, uh, was established through an Act of Parliament in 1867. And originally it, it came into being as the New Zealand Institute in 1867, and our role includes the advancement and promotion of research and scholarly activity. In many ways, it can be summed up as the pursuit of evidence-based knowledge across all disciplines. In that, we encourage, promote, and recognize excellence, and also raise public awareness and understanding of the knowledge being discovered. And that is why we're here this evening, to both celebrate and acknowledge absolute excellence and to hear about that, and what a privilege that is. The other part of the uh, privilege of this organization, and part of the thing, the very thing that enables it, is our membership. Um, and it spans many, many, many of New Zealand's top researchers who are part of our Academy of Fellows. And in addition to that, we have people who are leading in various other aspects of public life who are our companions. And then we have, uh, in addition to that, um, professional research members, uh, strongly knowledge-based organizations, and of course, our branches around the country. The Rutherford Medal, which came into being in 1991, is the most prestigious award offered by the Royal Society Te Aparangi. It consists of a medal and a prize of $100,000, funded by the government. And it's awarded annually at the request of the New Zealand government to recognize exceptional contributions to the advancement and promotion of public awareness, knowledge, and understanding in addition to eminent research or technological practice by a person or group in any field of science, mathematics, social science, or technology. And it is my huge pleasure to introduce distinguished Professor Philippa Howden Chapman this evening, who is the 2021 winner of the Rutherford Medal. Philippa is the Sesquicentennial Distinguished Professor of Public Health at the University of Otago in Wellington, is co-director of He Kainga Oranga Housing and Health Research Program, director of the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities and the WHO Collaborating Centre on Housing and Wellbeing. She conducts randomized community housing trials in partnership with local communities. And these have had major influence on housing, urban policy, and health. Her work focuses on reducing inequalities in the determinants of health and well-being. She's a director on the board of the Crown Agency Kainga Ora, Homes and Communities. She's a fellow of the Royal Society Te Aparangi and a former chair of the International Science Council Committee on Urban Health and Wellbeing. 
She has received numerous awards, including the Prime Minister's Science Team Prize. I've already mentioned the Royal Society Teaparangi's Rutherford Medal. And she was awarded a Queen's Service Order and made a Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for contributions to public health. So it is a huge privilege for me to introduce and, and invite to speak to us uh, distinguished Professor Philippa Hayden Chapman. very strange to see yourself in three times. Tuatahi ka mihi o ki te whāro whare e tu nei. Tuaroa ki mihi o ki ngā iwi ngā ti toa rangatira e tara nga ki whāno ki te upukau ki te ika. Tuatora ka mihi o ki te Royal Society Aparangai. Tuawha ko mihi ki te kopapa o tēnei rā. Tua rimu ka mihi o ki nga whānau e nga hoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Lovely to see you all here on such a cold, wet night. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the work that I and my colleagues have done over a period of more than 25 years, actually and to make sure that you know that it's like all good things, it's not one person that does it, but many people, I have their photos here, and you can spot them around the... <laughs> so, Hekang Oranga is the Housing and Health Research Program, and we were set up 25 years ago um, to improve uh, housing and health. And we chose housing, we thought about a number of areas we might work on, um, finance, um, uh, education, employment, but we decided that home was the nexus that was the most important determinant of health. Because we spend 75% of our time at home, and we know that from the time use survey. Uh, younger and older people spend about 90% of their time at home. And we know that warm, dry homes are absolutely essential to keep us well, but we also know that our homes can be cold, damp and mouldy. Now we started off, um, I worked, our team is an interesting one because I'm a social scientist, but I work with economists and engineers and physicists and <laughs> lots of people who are very good at data. <laughs> And, um, and so we, we pull our ideas, and most particularly, we set ourselves at the beginning that we didn't know all the answers, and we learnt, um, we formed very strong um, relationships with Māori communities, most particularly at Wainui and Mata, the, the uh, Wainui Mata Marae Trust out there, an urban authority, but also with um, Māori communities and, and some Pacific um, around New Zealand. And so these were the problems that we looked at. We knew that respiratory problems were the main issue that are caused, we now know, as well as aggravated by damp, cold houses, asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular, those of you who have atrial fibrillation uh, have to keep in warm houses because you know if the house is cold, then that can make your heart go more irregularly. We knew from work that I and other, other people had done, uh, and it took us a long time to get this published, that actually um, COVID-19 was probably airborne as a virus, and so all that thing about touching surfaces was really not the main thing. Um, and we realised that close contact infectious diseases like rheumatic fever, which plagues um, the Pacific and Māori community in, in New Zealand, we have one of the highest rates in the world, and meningococcal disease, a dreadful disease that can paralyse people and, and also cause um, um, necrotizing fasciitis of limbs. And, and in general, we've done lots of study looking at if you're in cold, damp houses, um, you're more likely to be hospitalised, and you're more likely to die. So, there's a pretty serious reasons for working out what you can do to improve housing, and also um, showing that it actually works. So this is the team, and 
oh, I'm wearing the same top. <laughs> Very economical, I am. And uh, this is the, the, the this is members of our team, which I won't go through, but you will recognise a number of the people there. Um, we were celebrating with a little bit of that money, which mainly went back into research, I should say. <laughs> um, okay, so the, just setting the scene, um, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and then there's about 20 minutes of questions. So there's inequalities in housing tenure and we realised very early on, um, some people in the group did work on um, history of rental housing in New Zealand and um, we did other work that I'll continue with. This comes from the 20, 2018 um, census. There's a picture that's um, near where uh, Arlington is which I walk past most days to go to work, and I think it represents nicely that we build in areas where there's a, a whole Māori history, Taranaki tribes in particular in that area. So Māori only own 28, uh, Māori households, only 28% of them own a home. Pacific, it's even lower at 19. And home ownership declined relatively rapidly, um, uh, also for Europeans, but it's much higher at 57. Now, this is, this is an issue about having capital and wealth, but most particularly, even more so, private rentals, of course, are older, and we didn't have a building code until 1978. Um, poorer quality, and you don't have um, stable housing, um, much less stable than owner occupation. So there's a growing number of older people who do not own houses, and this is a particular issue of people coming um, getting superannuation, but that was based on the fact that people owned their homes by the time they retired. By the way, you don't have to look at the blue stuff um, underneath. This is papers, two papers we were asked to write by the top American journal about what we'd done, and also the Royal Society asked us to. So this is going to be available online, and you can, or you can ask us for any of the papers. So um, I've got a a printmaker myself, but I'm interested in paintings, and um, this comes from the Bowen ga Gallery, and I've asked Hiriata Uropata Tangahoi um, if I could reproduce her painting here, and I think we have to remember that one of the reasons that Māori have um, lower home ownership is that the Ropato they um, um, lost a lot of the land which was theirs, and there was actually a very large loss of land after the Second World War when the rates weren't paid with the men were away fighting in the Māori Battalion, and pretty terrible to actually lose your land because the rates weren't paid. Uh, and um, this is one by Faith Manis, and I think it's a lovely picture it's of her auntie um, sitting on the house and the winds and um, the environment around. And um, Juliet Peters, uh, one of my favourite printmakers, who um, for Pākehā, while still very concerned with gardens and environment, I thought this was a nice representation of, you know, little houses on the hillside, tiki-taki. <laughs> um, so it's a sample of my art collection. Uh, now, we, we, we came to prominence, really, because, um, well, I had done a, a, a community trial um, for my doctorate, but that was on alcohol, and um, I decided, this is the most, those of you, many of you will be familiar with this, but I'll just briefly outline what is again. If you, um, if you just take survey people or you take data about them, you don't know if it's something that's happened before or there's something major going on in their lives. Uh, but if you take a sample of people, so if I took all you and we were in a um, community trial, um, if I randomly assigned you to two groups, one who was going to res receive the intervention, whether it was insulation, uh, heater, uh, heaters, um, making your house injury proof or reducing injuries, uh, reducing mould, um, giving you a subsidy for electricity. These are all the trials that we've done. And in each case, we don't, we say, um, we don't do surveys without service. So in each of these places, an intervention. And if you're in the, if you're randomised to be in the intervention group, you get the intervention first. And we usually do it, we usually measure people the, uh, in the winter, so we measure everyone beforehand. We then randomise, and the people are of course volunteers, and people like it, about 85% of people we ask usually enjoy being part of it, so it's a good citizen science exercise. So uh, the, the intervention group gets it first, 
Then we measure after the, at the next winter to see if there's any difference between those people who've got insulation, heating, and so forth, and compare them with the people who are exactly as they were um, at the beginning. And at the end, actually, we see what the difference is there, and those are the ones I'm going to report briefly here. And at the very end, we make sure that actually the people who were in the control group, the people who didn't get it the first time around, um, got it at the end. So in the end, everybody got it, um, the interventions, but some people had to wait an extra year. This is the one of the first prints I bought of Robin White when I was working in Porirua. So the first study that we did was the housing, insulation and health study, and I put this photo in. Um, Julian Crane, who's a respiratory physician, um, Michael Baker, somewhat um, younger, oh, hi, Lara. a slightly younger Michael Baker, was <laughs> interested in communicable disease, Sarah Nichols, who worked for us. This was the physicist, Malcolm Cunningham, Chris Cunningham, who's a professor at um, Massey University, and me. And um, so that was the different um, groups that we had. And the, the study, going, we did it in seven different places around New Zealand, up north in the East Coast, um, West Coast, Christchurch. We traveled around a lot, went to lots of marais, and it was really exciting. And, um, and this is, we, was insulation in the ceiling, under the floors, and draft stopping. And it was the first time that this is, had been done as a randomized control trial. And we had, we, so we had seven communities, 500 pe people, and as I explained, they were divided into two groups. Some of my children who are here came along to some of the <laughs> talks that I gave in, in the marais, and we saw some beautiful marais around the country. And um, there were, we found significant improvements in self-reported housing conditions, but we also had independent measures. Um, we looked at their hospital admissions. We looked at how many times they'd seen a GP. And they reported that their homes were less cold and less damp. They had fewer, fewer wheezes and colds. And my husband, Wraith, who's an economist, kindly did the cost-benefit study of it and found that for every dollar um, that was spent, you got $2 worth of benefits. And this is a um, Nuhaka, um, beautiful marae um, up, up the east, um, east coast, yes. So the government, and this was an, um, um, this program we're really proud of because it's been supported both by the national government, green government, um, and it was set up under Labour government. The National continued it, and John Key said it was the thing that he was most proud of, actually, when he um, finally was up, um, you know, um, left politics. Um, but the Warm Up New Zealand, this Heat Smart program, this was, I, I this obsessed with grandchildren. This is the, uh, this is my favourite poster, half a million Kiwi snug as a bug in a rug. <laughs> and um, there are 900,000 homes in New Zealand with substandard insulation. Because we didn't say you had to have had insulation in your house, even a new house, until the first oil shock in 1978. And I thought, oh, maybe we should do something about these thin walls that we've got. And so the benefit-cost ratio is, was um, four to one overall for um, adults, for children six to one, and likewise for older people. And Arthur Grimes, who wasn't able to come tonight, did an update of the work that um, uh, Rafe had done earlier on. And the more information we got, now we've got pharmaceuticals and we've got deaths and so forth too, that um, each time we can add other things in, um, that makes a difference. So we now know that this is, a, this is an intervention. It costs about, at this stage, about Two, probably cost about three and a half thousand now. It was two, just over two thousand then. And I remember Bill English saying, Oh, we like your studies because we know if we put in insulation that we're going to get some benefits. And so we realized that the way that we had thought that using the most robust, robust studies and saying, Look, it's practical and we can show effective results really does make a difference. Um, and then Caro Fife, um, she did an update of it. There's now uh, almost a quarter of a million people who've had their homes insulated. And she, we now have the integrated data infrastructure, which you can, every time you have contact with a, um, 
uh, any government department, hospital, school, whatever, it's, it's in a very um, anonymized way that we can access and Shang and various other people and Neville are, are masters of this and there are quite a few mistresses of it too. One of them being Cara Fife and she found that the intervention group, the people who had had insulation and here we're contr con not controlling it, not doing an experiment but using matching people on the IDI, uh, that they had very reduced hospital emissions, 9.26 per thousand people, with a greater effect of cold specific um, things like that's pneumonia, all the things I measured before. And now we can look at pharmaceutical data and so forth. And so that um, this is an even stronger results than the earlier one. And this um, was funded by ECA, the study, the Energy Efficiency Conservation Authority. But we still only just had the homes up to 18 degrees, actually not up to 18 degrees, there were 17 degrees. And we know that the World Health Organization, which I'll come on to in a little while that I've um, worked with a lot, that um, you really need 18 degrees as minimum in a home. And if you're sitting, uh, you'll know if you're um, just reading or something, it, 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 you can get quite cold at that temperature. If you're not moving around, you really need to be 19, um, 20. And in New Zealand, where houses face north, the children's are usually in the back side of the house facing south, and the children's bedrooms are usually very cold, which is um, a problem. So now we did a heating study, and this is um, Neville, just up there. <laughs> who's just been made an inaugural professor for his great work, and Rafe, who's just sitting there. This is when we went out to the Marae, Wainui and Mata Marae, and we gave people a choice. We said, okay, we want to insulate all your homes, but now we're, um, and actually even people with asthma, um, we, we did this in four different areas. A lot of the people who had asthma, they still hadn't taken advantage of the get, being able to get free insulation. So it takes quite a lot of going over things. Um, so we wanted to know, we were, we were worried about the fact that these unflued gas heaters were pouring in from China very cheap. Um, in fact, the LPG, which comes from Australia, um, isn't cheaper than um, electricity. Um, so we, the, the question was, we didn't tell them all the bad things about um, unfree gas heaters, but we told them that we didn't want them to use them. That they're polluting, they put out formaldehyde, um, nitrous, uh, um, nitrogen dioxide, <laughs> and a lot of water vapour. And um, so we, we took out the unfood gas heaters, took out these little electric heaters that I grew up with and got chill beans, putting my feet on the top, and we placed them with heat pumps, um, wood pellet burners, and fluid gas heaters. In other words, the gas just doesn't go into the room, but it goes up a chimney. And we, and all these things, we don't expect people to pay any money. We raised money from um, a whole variety of sources, including um, Contact Energy paid for quite a lot of these things. And we found, this is Julian Crane, who's currently flying into warmer climates. And <laughs> he's in an aeroplane. <laughs> That's why he's going to be in 10 degrees warmer. Uh, uh, but he, he, he helped with the heating study. Uh, people were warmer, condensation was reduced. Because remember, you can't really heat a house if, you're, if it's, got, it's very moist, so you have to make sure it's ventilated as well, having heating. Less mould and mouldy smells. The amount of nitrogen dioxide was halved, and that irritates your lungs. It's very bad for your lungs. L levels of wheezing and coughing halved. And the effects were more, more marked in low-income families. So we, you can see that we chose our areas where there was a high number um, 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 Māori in the communities, we tried to make equal explanatory power between making sure that half the people in all our studies were, were um, Māori and, uh, and half were Pākehā. Um, uh, the effects were more marked in low-income families, largely because low-income families, I think, are larger. So you do one intervention in the house and more people are benefited. And they had two more days at school during winter which doesn't sound much, but children, once children get behind at school, it can be a real cumulative effect. So um, Helen, who can't be here tonight, has done um, sterling work and making sure, amongst other people, making sure that 
in the census, we decided, okay, we're doing this with little studies, but we want to know about the whole country. So we looked at, we, we, we were lucky big in Wellington, and we worked closely with Rosemary Goodyear at, um, uh, who's, who's the senior person in housing in, the, in um, Stats New Zealand. And we managed to um, persuade them of this and a number of other things, like when you had to answer that little bit about how much mould have you got in your house, a full bit of paper or more. That was another thing from our study, which I'll come on to. But um, we, this, this enabled to say energy use being cold. This was all the different kind of heaters we knew that were in New Zealand. And um, we were able to show, after we'd done the insulation and the heating study, um, and we were also at the same time looking to try and make sure that we were able to measure imp uh, housing tenure. I don't think um, Eleanor has been able to come down. She's, I don't think she's well either at the moment. Uh, that um, un until, until we've helped with um, Statistics New Zealand to clarify who was in rental housing, who was in public rental housing, who was in private rental housing, who owned it. And then recently we've been able to say, look at the, um, neither of these, e.g. renting, you go to another question, and now we know who's in boarding houses and emergency houses, which we've never been able to do before. And we find the same thing again, that rental properties are in poorer condition than owner-occupied housing. Tenants have poorer health than owner-occupiers. And with those, Ellie's done quite a lot of work on the power dynamics um, between landlords and tenants. So um, in, in, when there's a tight um, tenancy market, um, tenants are very um, loath to go to the um, tenancy tribunal for fear that they might be in some way marked and, 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 and that will be known, although that's now legal, although it was there was a kind of um, thing running there for a while. So a number of us, we, did, we decided, okay, we've got to make sure our cars work properly. Why don't we move to trying to get rental housing in, in better condition? And um, Lucy, somewhere here, Lucy here, and I and, um, and um, Julie Bennett. Um, we spent a lot of time sitting under the... Um, working out how we could have a rental warrant of fitness and we had an app and we got landlords to do it and of course there were many conscientious landlords who really wanted to um, make sure that their proper properties were up to, up to scratch and people got the idea well if you've got a you, the car has to have a warrant of fitness why doesn't a rental property has uh, and it's interesting because I've spent time in the states and and, and looked at the housing there and, and the accommodation supplement that we have in New Zealand, which can go for either renting, topping up your, your rent, or a mortgage, actually. You can't get that in the States. It's a fed, uh, unless it's a federal grant, government grant, and they have to send someone out to look at the quality of the house you're either going to buy or rent. Um, but we don't do that in New Zealand, so you can get accommodation supplement even if the house is below standards. And under the, um, as Lucy's been um, reminding people who are um, concerned about in the paper, there, there are basic, um, we, we still have a 1947 um, housing regulations, which say that you can't have damp mould houses, but it actually hasn't been included in this very well. So we've still got some joining up of regulations to do. So this rental work war on fitness and healthy home standards, which I just made that point, um, I see we're not going to have a capital gains tax <laughs> used it tonight. So it, it, it which uh, it ha has a problem because um, it, at the moment, and depending on different parts of the economic cycle, you can actually, if you're doing it for investment, um, you can get more from capital gains than you can from rents. So it sort of um, uh, skews things a bit. So in any case, we were, had this rental warrant of fitness. It was all ready to go. We had people who were going out to doing it and trained. And then the government, we were delighted, brought in this compulsory healthy home standards. And these the, 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 uh, this is Lucy up there. And um, insulation, heating, ventilation, draft stopping, and requirement for smoke alarms. The, 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 we, the fire brigade actually puts a lot of those in. But you see, it doesn't explicitly say damp rental housing in the... Um, uh, or, or, or mould. So, um, and you, you, 
it's it's unclear the the the, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment doesn't have a list of where all the rental houses are. So, and they relies on the landlord um, telling the people. So this quite, we, we, we have very light-handed regulation in New Zealand. Heard that? <laughs> okay, so uh, we work very closely with brands here, um, the House Condition Survey. They're just doing one at the moment, so this is the one that they did in 2016. It's very valuable work that they do. And you can see that the ones I just want to point out, mould was visible in 49% of houses. Now, for most people, it's an, you're not going to actually get an illness from mould, although if you're immune compromised, you can get it all through your lungs. Um, so it's not safe for you, but it's unsightly, and people feel embarrassed about their home. And if it's, if it's black, if it's staphylococcus, that can be extremely da dangerous. The spores that come from mould, some of the most toxic <coughs> substances that we know. Uh, and you see that only, um, only about, we think about half the houses in New Zealand are properly insulated at the moment. You can go and look at that on the brands thing. Okay, now the other area that we were interested in, this is more, less structure than in how the houses was used, was crowding. And this is Amanda Klaasvig, who's just um, submitting a, a, an excellent paper reviewing all the evidence on this to The Lancet. Um, and Michael Baker, the eponymous Michael Baker. <laughs> okay, so... Um, in, in the census, we actually asked um, how many people are staying in, or we didn't ask, the Stats New Zealand asked this, and asked to count everyone. And we, so we know the number of people in each house. Um, we don't know the ages of them in the Canadian um, occupancy standard. Um, says, well, if, you know, young children can share a bedroom and um, children up to 17, you can have a boy sharing with a girl, but they have sort of mixture between um, taking account of you need enough air in a, in a house, household and, and also the social aspects of it. And this has been um, very important work that's been done. Um, Amanda's a paediatrician. And then um, Claire Aspinall, who's up there, um, um, she has done work on boarding houses and one of the most um, um, humbling experiences I've had is when she appeared, was it 2013, I think? 2013 in the Select Committee in Parliament when um, Claire had done work around boarding houses and showed that if rental houses, um, many rental houses are not in good condition, boarding houses are in terrible condition, although there are, of course, good ones. And now it enables, we got this into the um, working with stats, we now can know these, you know, apartments, mobile dwellings and other kinds. And um, until 2023, you know, there's two parts of the census. You answer your personal things and you ask about your dwelling. Until 2023, the one that um, um, we just had, only people in permanent houses answered that dwelling part. So there was no measure of um, homelessness. Um, we, we helped to... Um, put one together, or um, Claire and, and um, Kate Amore are coming on to one next. So of course the um, now boarding and transitional houses are quartered, but we've got this rather, we've got boarding houses, we've got transitional houses, we've got emergency houses, so things are getting pretty complicated. Um, and we, one of the problems about boarding houses, they're poorly regulated and infrequently inspected. And with the, with the housing shortage, there was a very smart idea of actually, as people weren't coming into work so much, of um, um, tra um, transforming um, old office buildings into, uh, uh, this was an old bank, I think, originally, into um, boarding houses. And of course, they're including the people present here, uh, do amazing state-of-the-art work here. But unfortunately, not everybody's like this, and there's no requirements, actually, to have um, um, sprinklers. Thank you. <laughs> sprinklers in these um, places, and so um, we had that huge tragedy that shook us all up. Now, I said the measuring of homelessness is... Um, um, the, the, 
um, work that um, Neville's done and his um, members of the group more than I have. But we have, we've been really concerned about the quality of housing full stop, not just rental housing. And so um, together, Kate Amore and Helen Vigors and, and I, to a certain extent, we did. We went through the census and working for the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, we looked at housing lacking baking, basic amenities and homelessness. And these were the basic amenities that they looked. Who had cooking facilities? Who had tap water that was safe to drink? Who had a kitchen sink? Who had a fridge? Who had a bath or a shower? Who had a toilet? Electricity supply? Or none of these available in the building? And that... Um, uh, and Kate, this is based on Dr. Kate Amore's work, who is a medical doctor, but got very concerned about the position of homelessness people. And we found that the number of houses, in fact, 23,000 dwellings in the 2018 census were lacking um, am amenities. Um, the ones that were most commonly not there in houses, and this is both, this is private, rental houses and, and home ownership. Drinkable tap water and electricity were the two basic amenities most commonly lacking. And we think that rheumatic fever one, is one of the diseases that if children aren't able to wash a lot, um, that's one of the things where it can pass from skin diseases and getting rheumatic fever. And children in migrant communities are particularly exposed. Um, a brief thing, this is um, talking about Neville's research and two of the people who've worked very closely with him on it is Jenny Ombler and Dr. Brodie Fraser. And um, there is a cohort of homeless people, there's the idea of ho housing first that we've um, borrowed from overseas but actually adapted in Māori communities here. Um, it, as a sort of whanau order approach. And now through this integrated da data infrastructure, we can look back before people were housed, and there are an awful lot of people on the streets at the moment in Wellington, I'm sad to say, and we follow them before and after they were housed. And the, this is government administrative data. We, it's not, it's going to a special um, a booth with high, very high security, and you don't take out any individual data. But we were, they were able to show that there was a rise in income from both benefits and paid work. Incomes were still low, but significantly improved. Very excitingly, these five-year results are, are, are just being written up. Um, big drop in hospitalizations and injuries. Initial rise in a small drop in outpatient service. Big improvements in mental health. Drops in justice interactions, i.e. going to court and or being with the police, small rise in victimisation. And Brody um, done the work on looking at gender diverse people show LGBTQI are a very high level, find it very often um, um, teenagers because you asked to leave the family home and really hard to get um, flats. And, and Kim up here, um, um, a number of us, but Kim was leading at the moment, did work on energy poverty. And this was recognising that, <laughs> recognising that um, many households know that they want. Everybody likes to be um, um, warm, but they don't have enough sufficient energy to um, sufficient money to pay for energy. And in fact, we've got a side project looking at um, smart grids um, that um, we are hoping to. Um, get in public housing and other housing, um, renewable energy. Um, Kim did work on prepayment meters, uh, showing that they were more expensive, just like if, uh, on, on the phone, if you have to do a prepaid phone, you're higher up. And, and, and very worryingly um, showed that 53% of people with prepayment meters were disconnected in the previous year. And you remember Mrs. Mulianga, who had needed oxygen and the phone was disconnected and, and she died. And she, we look as much as possible for things that make sense to the community, like dragon breath that um, we had a lot of when I was growing up. And when you woke up in the morning and your bedroom was really cold, the sort of condensation from your breath. And um, Kim, who's done lots of work with communities, has seen that um, school performance, health and mental health are affected. And we're continuing this work. Um, we've done work in um, energy policy case studies, um, Dr. Marianne Tariki um, works with us on this, and Dr. Ramana Tia Tia. 
<laughs> up the back there, <laughs> um, um, we looked at energy use in Kiribati and Samoa, and we were looking at innovation solutions, rather like the renewable energy ones we're trying to do in New Zealand now. Um, uh, Ramona did some excellent work looking at the um, what in East Porirua is a case study. How does a family manage if there's a child with rheumatic fever in the in the family, in a quite a crowded household? And basically looked at a very interesting how, how uh, the sophisticated ways in which families arrange for some children to go to grandparents or um, other members of the extended family so that the child can be. Um, kept warm and dry, but is not, not likely to infect other people. So we, we're building up a picture of um, cumulative prob problems from crowding and, and energy poverty leading to cold houses in New Zealand. Now, one of the things that we measure, so we're looking at things that we think will make a difference. We do the studies, we do the costing of it, and then we use the, the population data of the whole to see what difference it made. And um, this is the latest um, data that we've got for heating sources by the census. And you can see that this goes from um, 1980 to 2017. And this was, so this is before we were doing the heating study and then this after when the heating study and the insulation study came out. And you can see that um, this includes heat pumps, which have increased hugely in, in, in New Zealand. The, the wood has declined slightly. Um, the, the bottled gas here, we are delighted. This is the period when it came in when suddenly all those heaters were employed. I'm not, if you've got one, I, I see there's quite a lot of them at the tip shop, but I think they're worthwhile keeping if the electricity goes out or we have a, um, if there's a flooding or something and you need, you know, so they're, they're good as a real backstop, but not to be used at all. Um, and not to mention the fact you can catch a dressing gown on it and go off in flames, which people have done. So you can see here, the bottle gas became portable and, um, 2018 is almost entirely disappeared. Disappeared now. Sorry. Uh oh. Uh oh. Just a minute. Sorry. Uh, so we're very pleased about that. And coal, which used to be, if you had any family member who'd been in a um, worked for the West Coast and was in a union, you got free coal for life. And then Contact Energy decided they weren't going to do that anymore. <laughs> and not Contact Energy, the other one. Um, so that's almost stopped. Very few people have cold in their, their, um, for their heating. Although people who did in our studies, they, were, they had the warmest homes. They were 20, 23 degrees, 25 degrees. So people, it's not that people don't like to be warm. If it's free energy, they use it. Okay, we've, we're work, doing work on indoor air pollution and ventilation. And Julie and Julie's a bit of a warrior here. Um, she did the work on the the energy study looking at levels of nitrogen dioxide. I've mentioned that she's part of a technical consultation group on transmission of pathogens through the air. And um, she's looking at, in the work that we do here, we have both quantitative and qualitative work. So she's doing studies with um, brands, looking at behavior, who opens windows, and, and as a way of thinking about how we can change the behavior and getting more ventilation and more air circulation inside houses. Um, we call Caroline the queen of mould <laughs> in New Zealand. And this was largely her work that got this um, in the census. Is this dwelling damp? Um, these questions, you will have, hope you will fill this in. Uh, we know that from her work um, done with Julian Crane and, and myself and other people, uh, damp and mould were related to new onset wheezing in children. Now wheezing, um, respiratory phys physicians say that it can be a precursor of asthma. It's not necessarily, but if you've had a child that's wheezing, it's very distressing and that's damp and mould are very bad for that. And of course, if the child's in this cold south um, bedroom, you don't want that. And damp and mould are related to early childhood hospital admissions for acute respiratory infections. And we've worked, Tristan Ingham did a big, Māori researcher did a big study on this. And Caroline and I have done um, work on the leaky buildings, which was 
a disastrous lack of regulation in New Zealand. Uh, so we did moved away from um, actually changing the houses and we thought, well, actually, it's clear now that people can't actually afford electricity and there's various people in the, in the audience who can tell us why we can't afford electricity. Uh, and, and so we decided to give $500 electricity vouchers in the winter to 600 old people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's really like adult asthma. You probably know someone who can't actually get their breath in. That's a very distressing condition. And um, Helen did this, um, how much heat can you buy for 500? We told them that heat was their medicine and this enabled people basically to heat through a winter. Uh, and households with the vouchers use more electricity than those not getting it, but not to the full value of the voucher. The economists would tell us that in a sense, if you know you've got $500 in your account, you don't have to use it all at one time or you might... Um, you, 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 it, it, it's substitutable for other, other services. Um, better than it was when it was in Wales where they gave it just before Christmas time and there was a feeling that it went on Christmas presents, presents so we did not do it just before Christmas. There's a bigger difference in low prior use households. So once people realised that it was so much nicer to be warmer, um, then they did use more of their energy. And the, one of the other things that um, we start, started as a community initiative out in the hut and now uh, under Neville and um, his team, um, this has become a huge success and they won the Prime Minister's um, policy prize for this. It's a government funded intervention. It was originally charitable, so I was... Um, we wasn't sure how it was going to be maintained, but now the government funds it. It's, it's nationwide. It's increasingly um, owned by community organisation with a strong whānau centred approach. And um, interventions include insulation, heating, draft stopping, minor repairs, mould removal, home energy service and referral to other services. And if you look briefly here down below, by December 2021, um, these are refer referrals either from communities or um, doctors in the hospital because there's a rather tragic thing in New Zealand hospitals where they say, oh, it's another frequent flyer. And it's someone who's already been in hospital a number of times but's coming back again because, of course, they're going back to the house with the sole, same cold, damp thing. And we thought, this is crazy. Let's break this rather terrible cycle. And this is they, 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 this is the... Conclusions from a lot of work, um, over 9,000 hospitalizations were prevented and we can tell this because we can see what it was like before they got this uh, Healthy Homes Initiative and then what it's like once they've got it. So there's a before and after. And here, you know, extra days for school and um, reduction in benefits for the 24 to 64 year olds. So in other words, they were able to go into employment. And that's, there's... Um, and uh, by all of these studies have got a lot of interest overseas and um, 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 we've, Neville and I have done, th well, I've done things on China, on China news. Um, there's the Japanese are just coming to make a little film about this. The BBC did a, um, um, did a short um, little film on this too. So this is Kura Tuaru Rewuri who um, uh, said I could show her this picture. I always like this one, the renter and her children. And this is the things that come into the Healthy Homes Initiative. Mold cleaning, it's the things that we mentioned before. And this is for, you don't just have to be a renter for this, because quite a few people in this um, are in homes that they may be inherited from their parents. They don't have enough capital to actually maintain their homes. So sometimes, and it's very hard if you're, um, depending on what your income is, to actually get money from the bank. Okay, so the last study that we're going to look at is this injury control trials. Michael Keel, who's in Spain, but coming back soon. Uh, Chris Cunningham. Uh, this was a, the idea that this is the place where most ACC money is spent. It's not on the rugby field, it's not on the netball field, it's at, in homes. And um, home in, this is the home injury prevention study. And basically we employed this very nice um, um, uh, builder. And he went round, we randomised again, 
you know, first time the intervention people got it, then Lou did, and he put things like strips on the edge of steps, um, put handrails, the number of people who go out the back door where there's no handrail, carrying a basket of washing or bringing shopping in, four break their femur, a huge. So every step should actually have a ha handrails there. And that's what we did. Um, so um, the, these both trials were highly cost beneficial, particularly for Māori with larger families. Again, because there are more people in the house, there are more people who can benefit from changes to the house. And then um, Chris did another study, a MIPI study, which was in, um, uh, in, the, in the Māori community and found that's where we can compare the results with that. Okay, and then just very briefly, <laughs> you look by the right there. This is a cost benefit analysis. This is the first one we did. And it, it, this is really important because all these things that we've done, even though people didn't have to pay themselves, we had to find the money from somewhere from this. And so we're, but instead of people say, oh, there's trade offs, we didn't do this, we could do something else. But we are showing, and the wellbeing budget has really made this easier for us. What are all the benefits, what are the costs of an older person tripping on the back steps and and um, breaking their femur and then having to go into a home because they can't support themselves at home, compared to um, being able to be, you know, live another 10 years independently. Uh, so um, this, in any case, as I mentioned before, the cost of um, the benefits from this, even a narrow set of benefits, was twice what the cost was there. Now then, the last, the very last thing is we did. We had a, we worked with Lynn Riggs, who would worked at the CDC in um, USA, um, a very um, and talented uh, economist, and she looked at, um, helped us to say what was the annual burden of disease from cold, damp, and mouldy homes. In other words, picking up all the costs of this, and she, um, for, uh, and these are the figures here um, for crowding. We know that there were um, 806 nights in hospital annually. It's probably you're talking about three, four thousand dollars a night in hospital. For cold homes, you know, 1,800. Dampness and mould. This is a real problem, as I said, in New Zealand, over 36,000. Home injury hazards. You can see 115. Um, you know, almost 116,000 annual accident claims, and we all we all pay this um, through ACC. So it's not like it's just the person themselves that benefit or their family. It lowers the cost for everyone, and we can spend it on things that are much more productive. And we, there are 229 deaths attributable each year, and this is very rigorously done. It was published in the WHO um, bulletin. Um, the, the estimate is there's a, a billion dollars we would save if we improved housing in New Zealand. Okay, and then finally, um, finally, that's the third time I've said that. Finally, <laughs> there's a bit like this thing. This took me eight years, but I was chairing a WHO health guidelines group, and um, they, we did big systematic reviews. We consulted with everybody around the world, and these are the things that are really important. Top of the list is crowding. That is the thing that causes most problems. Um, low indoor temperatures um, nest, uh, and also high indoor temperatures, which um, Kim starting to do work on. Not such a problem at the moment in New Zealand, but still evident and a huge problem if you're in um, um, many other parts of the world, the injury hazards, which still hasn't been put into any codes in New Zealand. And the accessibility of housing for people with functional impairments, people with disabilities that... Um, um, is, is a high priority that we need to do and um, we're, they're trying to the more if, if you put a house with universal design in it or an apartment um, which of course many people out of their lifetime will need um, it's seven times cheaper than if you have to retrofit a house okay conclusion uh, so uh, the main thing I wanted to say is that I think consistent, competitive, we weren't given any money, um, um, research funding has enabled our group, which are really committed, um, to pose questions, to plan and collect data. And we, we sit around and we have fun um, 
uh, working out what strategically is their gaps in information and health questions. And we have strong relationships with you know, Kaingora, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, MSD and so forth. So we've, I've talked about the intervention studies and the interventions, we always, we don't just pick something out of the air and think oh, it'll be fun to do that. We want, we want to select something we know that will make a difference intervention framed as policy-ready solutions um, that can usually often supported by advocacy group, um, groups like Rented Uniters or Green Building Council and so forth, and adopted by different political parties. We, we're, we're very, um, we want this to be just um, de rigueur, just a, a, the sensible thing to do in New Zealand. Um, and our research has provided an evident base for the Warm Up New Zealand program, the winter energy fuel payments and the healthy home standards for rental housing. And um, not content to do that, we're doing a big project at the moment on public housing and urban regeneration, looking at seven different ways of doing housing, but I'm not going to talk about that now. And Neville's doing um, work on um, ensuring um, our New Zealand tamariki and youth get the best possible start. So, Gordon Crook, who lives, used to live in the Arrow Valley, along with me. I learned, this is one of his prints, a long story. So I hope my story hasn't been too long, but, <laughs> but given an understanding of what our values are, how we've operated, and we feel, I think, some, some pride in what we've actually managed to um, accomplish. In fact, taxi drivers now tell me about New Zealand houses today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah.